We got a bit of them lonesome lockdown blues. Hello. <laughs> How are we all? I hope lockdown is treating you all very well. <laughs> I want to say something every now and then if you're bored ooh, and if you have a lockdown hairdo maybe you should just do something for fun <laughs> just whatever you feel like doing so about about 20 minutes ago I said to myself I don't know why the the um uh, the thought came into my head of the lockdown blues <laughs> so I said I'm gonna do the lockdown blues and so that's what I did. Got my guitar out. Got some random clothing to put on. <laughs> Sunny's indoors. An old hat. And this hip jacket. The jacket has... Wait. It does. It does have elbow patches. Very important. Elbow patches. That's how you know that I am, uh, I am respectable and um, uh, an important intellectual. In fact, you know what? Screw that. I'm not putting the guitar away, it's too much fun. I don't know if I just sent it out of tune by like, putting it back in its case a second ago. Should I do the whole thing in blues? I think this whole talk would take a very very long time if I did it in the blues. Alright, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna hang on to the guitar. And I'm just gonna put myself back over into the corner <laughs> again. Slightly different today. I've been fiddling around with all my cameras and stuff. I don't know if anyone was there last night. I was doing um, uh, doing some miniature painting stuff, and so my um, my my cameras had to all get moved around. But you know, this uh, today's debugging talk is going to be accompanied by Mark playing gl blues guitar. So we'll have your occasional. Little bit of guitar going on in the background just for the fun of it. Okay, okay, so <laughs> what are we talking about today? Today I was going to talk about debugging. So, this is one that I've really been thinking about for quite some time um, because. Just, just want to stay cool. Actually, no, 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 these, these glasses are polarizing. <laughs> I can't see my monitor properly with these. Alright, I, I, I thought, you know, everyone's in lockdown, everyone's probably a little bit like itching at the moment, so I didn't want to make this too formal or anything, but I do I do still want to give the talk about debugging because it's something that um, I've seen people struggle with a lot over the years. Um, people get caught up on the idea of like, you know, you've got the whole idea of what makes your, um, what makes your code work, but then when it stops working, it's like, okay, where do I go from here? And there's a lot of technical things you can learn. There's a lot of technical workshops on debugging. Um, but I wanted to give people a kind of a mindset attitude, kind of look at debugging. Uh, <laughs> BT says, just play a pentatonic scale over the entire talk. That's not even pentatonic. It's part of pentatonic, anyway. Uh, Kaichi's asking for chicken cam. Chicken is at the moment really, really happy. Um, she's she's on the bed at the moment, and like it's really cold right now. So she was saying that she saying she wasn't saying, but like she she really wants it warm. So I, I built I built a little nest for her out of the doona, and she's not coming out of there for a while. Okay, so what are we actually talking about today? I'm gonna give you the secrets of debugging and the secrets of there are no secrets. I apologize. <laughs> There's no secrets. I'm opening it up with sadness, with the blues. So, unfortunately, there are no kind of like super, super tricks that just make this work. If there were super tricks that made this work, we'd all know them, you know, so that's, that's the way it goes. But there's a lot of little things that we can do, there's little techniques and procedures that we can try to follow to try to get our heads around the idea that um, fixing our code is, is, is an awkward and difficult thing to do. So 
what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit of like what to do when your brain can't handle it in a sense. So this is like, you know, debugging, we think of it as a very technical process. Um, but I'm actually going to talk a lot about debugging as a, um, as a cognitive process. Because one of the issues that I think that we're going to get a lot of the time is that our brains work in particular ways uh, and our brains work in very different ways to computers and because our brains work in different ways to computers um, we can't really think the way they do and the only way to really debug successfully is kind of to think the way the computer does which is a little awkward, right? Um, <laughs> that's fun. I'm just gonna do a whole course like that. And just like every time I want to like punctuate a point or something or give you so give you some time to think, I'll just play some music for you. There's also a handout here. So there's this link. Hang on. Oh, I don't know if I can paste this. I can. Oh, CC Sock has also pasted the handout. So let me just show you. This is kind of my script for this. Um, I wrote this years ago, actually. I wrote this before I came back to UNSW. Um, I can see there's a whole bunch of people in here already having a look at it. You can look at it if you want. Um, I, I'm not going to say exactly what's in the script, but the script kind of informs uh, what I'm going to be talking about. So let's go back here. Oh, people are watching the slides as well. Um, so if you, if you need the link to the slides, I'm not sure who's on the CCSOC account right now, but whether you... Um, uh, whether you linked up the slides as well, uh, the I think the CCSOX Discord has links to both of these. So, it's a little bit like a lecture, it's not full on like a lecture. Um, it's got Mark playing guitar in it, so it's obviously not that serious. I have a feeling that being too serious about anything that we're learning is always, like, going to be difficult anyway. So, so, what my approach is here is... is to try to get us to to think about how to rewire our brains when we get locked. So I have these steps um, and these are my kind of debugging tricks. So you know when you're just normally debugging, you write your code, you test it, something goes wrong and you go, oh, okay, I need to fix that. That's fine. That's normal. You just fix your code, right? But what we're going to do is we're going to like think about what happens to the point where you've tried a few things and you can't get it going. And you're like, I don't, I don't know what to do now. Like, I don't, my, my brain can't see the solution to this problem. Um, I can't think about what's going on. Um, what do I do? So I have these steps. I'm not going to go through exactly what these steps are now. They're just here as like a kind of a table of contents. Um, and I'm going to go through each of these and talk about what they mean and how they can help you. But before we get into that, we're going to talk about like kind of what debugging is. This is like one of my favorite memes. Um, that I think, I put this in comp 1511, I think, I can't remember, but, um, being the detective in a crime movie where you're also the murderer, it's quite funny, um, that you, like, you, you can't really, most of the time, you can't blame anyone for your code not working other than yourself. I mean, sure, you can you can go have a chat with your colleagues who are working on the same thing and stuff, or someone else has created something that's caused a problem. It's like, yeah, okay, but you're still gonna help debug their code anyway. But usually, um, it's like, you know, the code that you wrote in the last hour has caused a problem um, and it's not working. And it's, it's entirely what you've done. And I think computing is one of the really, really particular fields in the world where you can create problems for yourself and you can't even really see them being created as they're happening. I mean, one could say, one could say that life is just like that, you know, like every, um, every now and then we make decisions for ourselves that we think are in our best interests, but later on we find out that they were not, uh, and then we have to, like, debug life. And ain't that just the blues? All right, show's over, let's go. <laughs> anyway. So, so what, what is debugging? So I, I tried to think about this and just kind of go, okay, if we, if we remove 
the computer science from debugging. We remove the code, um, we remove the fact that we're working with computers or something like that and think about, okay, what is the mental process? What is the human process around debugging? I was trying to figure out what it was. Um, so I came up to this, came up with this idea. It's like analytical retrospective problem solving. Um, and it's, it's nearly, it's not just retrospective, it's introspective as well, where it's like, where we're not just trying to figure out, um, what went wrong in the past. We're trying to figure out what we did wrong in the past. And so it's very, very, it's very weird kind of thing to do, but it's also analytical. It's very systems based. Um, we have to figure out how a system with really specific rules isn't working because of something that we've done with it. So this is this kind of interpretation or simulation of a system in our head. And, and like, you know, we, we all know this, right? Because like you're, you're all like, I think most of you at least who are here are doing degrees, um, in computing which means that you're, you're needing to spend like a minimum, I'd say three years, just trying to learn how a computer works. Um, and that's a difficult thing to do. Um, and it's kind of like, we're trying to figure out what, um, what is happening in our computer when we inherently don't understand it, you know? So there's this, this disconnect between our meat brain and our silicon brain. Well, it's not our silicon brain, I guess it is, you own it, but it's not, it's not part of your body, the silicon brain that you're using. Um, and we're trying to figure out what's going on in the silicon brain using our meat brain, and the meat brain just doesn't think in the same way. So there's this mismatch, right? There's this mismatch between what's happening. Well, actually, it's a different miss. The, we have written something and then we've thought something or we were supposed to do something and they're not the same. We're trying to figure out what that is. Um, and so it's like, I've got, I've got all these technical terms, but like this third point here is like, is nearly like what I'm thinking is, is that like, how do we look at complex stuff and see whether it's right or not? Um, and this is, this is like super difficult. And the reason it's hard is that human brains are the wrong type of computer. We don't process data sequentially. We don't say this, then this, then this, then this, then this. If you try to like logically infer things by going this, then this, then this, then this, then this, you're going to end up having to put a whole lot of like effort in to make that work. Um, whereas if someone says to you, um, I don't know, smooth like butter, like a criminal undercover, you're going to start singing the rest of that. So I don't know, is, do we have BTS stands here? Do we have, do we have, I don't know how to play the song on guitar. But anyway, like if you start, um, or, or even worse, even worse. Let me, let me throw a different earworm at you. Um, I'm a Barbie girl in a Barbie world. Um, feel free to type in chat, whatever comes into your head next. We have brains that just hop between random things. And I love, I hope, I hope I haven't ruined everyone's day by that, but also a little bit hope that I have, right? So what I'm just trying to describe is that human brains just don't go in straight lines. We don't, we don't go exactly into the things that we're supposed to be doing. Um, which means that we do not have a specifically sequential process. We do not have infallible logical maths capability. Should point out, should point out that the computer also does not have infallible logic and maths capability. It's not infallible. We get some random photons coming out of the, out of the sun, or well, not photons, but just like, you know, random background radiation of the universe hits our RAM at the right time and our computer's not going to actually function the way we think it is. But let's, let's set that aside for the moment and say, yeah, okay, the computer is basically going to have um, a good amount of good working memory and the ability to, um, to do logic and maths without making mistakes, whereas the human brain straight out does not have that. We can't even do simple maths without making mistakes. Like anyone ever had to just add up the bill at a, at a restaurant with, you, with your friends and just try to figure out what you're doing. And then you just like, you just can't do it. Someone has to write something down instead. Like our brains are so complex and so capable, yet simple things like that um, fall apart. So what I'm trying to say here is that the meat brain trying to debug the computer brain is an inherently difficult thing to do because we just have the wrong type of brain. Like our RAM, like it's really, really funny. The human RAM has... Cognitive load. I don't know if people have studied some of the courses at CSC that talk about that. I think 3511 talks about this. We can hold about five to nine objects in our brain at any particular time. Five to nine objects. Um, how many, how many objects, objects, you know, what the hell is an object? Uh, can a computer hold? The computer can probably hold billions, I would say. 
Um, whereas we can hold five to nine things at once. That's how much we can work with. That's like our RAM or our cache, depending on how you think about it. Um, and so with that, we, we tend to fall over really quickly once our code gets more complex than having only, say, five to nine lines of code for us to look at at one time. Or if we're lucky and we've portioned stuff off into functions and stuff like that, you could think about five to nine functions at a time. That's the other weird thing about the human brain is like we can, we can hack our cognitive load by just encapsulating things in other things. Um, super, super weird. I don't exactly know how it works. Not a cognitive scientist, but I've seen it a little bit of it in action. <laughs> Someone said you're made of plastic. So, so, so there, um, people did, uh, oh no. <laughs> okay. So Barbie girl was the wrong, was, was the wrong, uh, song because that's like, I don't know, nineties, two thousands. Maybe, maybe the, um, uh, maybe the BTS reference was enough. I'm actually wearing my black pink shirt today. Anyway. anyway okay. So human brains don't necessarily do it correctly. And so what I'm trying to do is approach this problem from the, the viewpoint of, um, of, of knowing that the meat brain is bad at debugging, knowing that the meat brain is bad at, um, at, at trying to understand what the silicon brain is doing. And so how do we take a problem that is like inherently technical, inherently logical, and, and, and ease the load on what the meat brain has to do to actually like figure that out. So let's see what we can do. So this is the, this is the first step of the, uh, what is it? Seven, eight step pro I, so let's, let's not call this like an eight step process. I hate that kind of language. You know, it's like step one, do this step two. And so I'm, I'm actually doing this like it's a self-help thing. It's not really a self-help thing. Um, also the steps aren't in order. <laughs> I mean, they are, but use this how you, however you need, you're going to be jumping around these steps as you need. So step one, walk away. And I know that's a really weird thing to say because, um, the whole point of you trying to use this guide to debug something is, um, is so that you can, um, so that you can solve your problems. And a lot of the time when we get caught up in our work, we think that solving our problem involves working on it, right? It involves spending the time with the problem to make the problem go away. Um, but I'm going to say this other thing because I'm looking at this from a meat brain perspective, uh, take a break, walk away. So I put this in here, fuck work. Right. Um, apologize for the swearing. I don't know. CC suck. We, am I allowed to swear? Too late. It's already happened it's in the slides. <laughs> I actually can't, I can't even take it back now. It's already happened, but, but it's an attitude. It's a, it's something that happens to us. It happens to us all the time. We reach a point where we're just like, I cannot do this anymore. This is just breaking me. And if this statement resonates with you, then you probably do need a break. And also, if you've hit a point where you're like, I need to read a debugging guide to figure out what's wrong with what's happening at the moment, I need to find out what's broken in my code, or whatever, then you need a break. Because you've already tried everything that you were like instinctively or intuitively thought of. So everything that you were like, ah, oh, I'll do this, then I'll do this, I'll do all these steps that worked before, then if that works, you don't need this guide. But if you hit this guide, you probably need a reset. So, um, our brains are not the same kinds of machines as our computer brain. Um, they, they literally run on sugar as energy. Um, they can literally get tired. I mean, I know your computer can get tired sometimes. <laughs> That's usually a software issue. That's usually our fault as well. <laughs> Someone didn't completely debug the, the, the game or the, the, the program or the operating system that, um, that you're using. Um, but you'd need to rest your mind, right? <laughs> Toby said I'm about to get cancelled on Theronka. <laughs> um, oh, sorry, I just realized my microphone is up really high. I think um, that's left over from chicken ASMR last night. <laughs> Although I think it does need to be pretty loud to pick up the guitar, because the guitar's not plugged in. Okay, okay. So, I find this deeply ironic that I have a title in my slides that says Achieve Complete Distraction. Um, because if there's any 
any teacher you're ever going to have at UNSW, <laughs> any lecturer, who is capable of achieving complete distraction while they're apparently supposed to be teaching people things, sign me up for that award. I just like doing that bit. It's fun. Um, so, in order to get a fresh outlook on things, you might need your brain to to actually become fresh, to take a reset. So, um, CC Circus said bad words are allowed. Okay, I'm not going to get cancelled. I mean, that's good, because my bad words kind of follow me around. I hope that's not a, not a problem too much. I know it could be, so I apologize. I'll try to only use it when it's actually really, really important. It needs to resonate. Um, get it, resonate. Because I'm playing music. Uh, okay, so play a game, read a book, take a walk, have a nap, um, have a shower. Uh, all of these things are probably going to be able to reset your mind. Everyone's different. Um, people's minds reset in different ways. So I did these kind of in the order that I might do. Or not even that. Have a nap will come before take a walk. Oh, at the moment I can't even take a walk. Where uh, my partner and I are now close contacts of a uh, of a COVID case near where I live, so we're like literally not allowed to walk past our front door until about a week from now. So that's why that's why I'm singing the lockdown blues. Yeah, <laughs> just for fun. But get yourself to the point where you can't remember exactly what the problem is. Get it to the point where, like, cause you know, if you, if you have a problem with your code, um, it's gonna stick in your head, right? And it, it's gonna occupy your attention. What you need to do to get a brain reset to actually like really start to, to come back and try to solve the problem is usually um, to switch your context to the point where you've kind of forgotten what the problem was. And once you've forgotten what the problem was, um, then you'd actually be at a point where um, uh, you could come back and actually look at it with fresh eyes. And it's the same person looking at it, but you have a fresh perspective on it because um, you've reset your brain. Um, because what our brain tends to do uh, is is get itself get itself caught in loops. So as I was saying before, you get a song stuck stuck in your head, um, and that song will stay in your head for a long time. Your brain is stuck on a loop. Uh, problem solving works the same way. Our brain gets stuck in these problem solving loops and we start trying the same things again and again. We start acting irrationally. Um, and, it, and it's funny because like a lot of people think that it's like, I need to work on X, Y, Z. I need to work on this assignment. I need to work on this project and stuff. Um, but if you don't take adequate rests in between and you just keep trying to like hammer at the same problem, um, you're just going to waste time. You're actually going to waste more time than if you take a little procrastination. There is a reason why the human brain procrastinates. It actually needs that time. Not all the time, not all the time, but a lot of the time when you're procrastinating, it's because your brain has just said, I need to, I need to take some time. Um, I, I want to also say, like, don't, don't necessarily treat this as like, uh, I'm going to go off and like, play, play a game for like 10 hours or something like that. that I think you've gone way past the <laughs> the reset <laughs> once you get to that long run, it's like oh, I'm gonna read this book and like 30 hours later you've read the whole book and you're like no no you should have slept somewhere in that and you had your reset right so don't uh, and then when the nap turns into a whole night's sleep if a nap does turn into a whole night's sleep I mean honestly I should say maybe that's a good thing because maybe you needed a whole night's sleep but not here to this this one step of the debugging process is not supposed to be li entire life advice or anything like that so um, the, the idea is though, you think better once your brain has had a full reset, not just a, um, stand up for five minutes and turn around, um, distract yourself from it, get your brain onto different pathways and then come back. Um, that might be all that you need, which is a reason why this is the first step. Um, I don't know if people have noticed this. Um, I think people have definitely noticed this where, you can't solve a bug, you go to sleep, you wake up the next day and you solve it immediately in the morning. Your subconscious brain is incredibly intelligent. Like, you can't, can't discount the power of the subconscious brain and what you can do. Um, because quite often you're going to be in a situation where you, you achieve that reset and that was it. That was it. 
so this debugging guide, um, especially like the, the document that you can use, um, kind of has a sort of an escalation in the steps. Um, some steps are just going to work and then that's it. You, you're done. You don't need to come back. Um, but I'm going to keep going through the steps in case this didn't work. So you've had your brain reset. That's good. Now let's look at identifying a problem. I think this is something that people will be more familiar with with debugging because this is one of the things you get practice with whether you like it or not. You don't necessarily get practice with doing a brain reset. Um, but that's nearly like a mental health issue. Um, this, uh, this walk away thing. Because we can very, very easily put ourselves in situations where, where we're unable to deal with, with the pressure of what we're doing. Um, and a break is usually more efficient. Like if, if you want to just measure this, like not even mental health, you just measure this in productivity. You can see me sneering at that idea, right? Cause I hate measuring humans in terms of productivity, but if you want to, if you like doing that, you're more productive if you take the right breaks. Um, this is why like, you know, when, when companies try to get people to work seven hour, seven day weeks and stuff like that, it's like, you know, you're going to get less out of your people than if you, if they work five day weeks, like it, it literally doesn't work. Like they talk about like the productivity of, of companies that go into crunch <laughs> and it's like for the first two or three weeks, they get more product productivity out of their people. Um, but then after that, they get the same productivity that they had beforehand. Only they're working people seven days a week instead of five days a week. And they still don't get more productivity out of them because people are just fried and they're making more mistakes and slowing everything down. So that's why the break is good. Anyway, moving on. I keep doing that same set of chords because it's fun. Um, when we're trying to figure out what's wrong with our code, what we can see, the reason why we know there's something wrong with our code is because we can see some consequences. The only issue that we're going to get here and the subtlety, which is always interesting, is that you can see the consequences, but you can't see the problem. I mean, sometimes if you can see the problem, you don't need this. Your debugging is finished. Uh, you've already you've already debugged if um, if you can see what the problem is well maybe maybe you don't know how to fix it yet but um, usually we can see the consequences of something which is how we know that something's up and then we need to find out what the source is of that so what we're getting is like this is the idea of like what testing is and how it works um, like you know you could test by just compiling things and looking for compiler errors it's like the simplest thing that we can think of um, but then usually it's like you run stuff and then stuff comes out in a way that you didn't expect. That's the, the broadest way I can say that is like you, you, you try to execute your code and stuff comes out in a way that um, it's not what you wanted, um, not what you expected, but expected, but obviously is what you wrote. Um, so what we're at is this idea that like you can see the consequences, but you can't see the problem. So you need to go back through um, your, your process to try to find out where the cause is that, um, that, that created these consequences. Um, the difficulty here is that most code errors are actually the result of other code errors. What we're looking for is the code error that wasn't caused by another code error. So this is the needle in the haystack that we're looking for. And so this is like the error that starts the chain of errors. This is why when I'm teaching like the simplest, simplest version of debugging, I say to people, only try to fix the first error in your compiler. So if we're working in a compiled language, that compiler is usually like, I, I, I'm trying to make this whole thing really net language agnostic, but the compiler is usually going from top to bottom in your code. It's usually starting from the top of your code and reading it and then then anytime something doesn't match up, it'll say, okay, here's our problem. So yeah, we can start from the first error there because if it's going top to bottom, it's reasonably likely that that's going to be the first code that runs. Again, super caveat here. Every programming language works a slightly different way. Every compiler is working in a slightly different way. But what we're looking for is the error that's not caused by another error. Um, we're looking for the, the patient zero. <laughs> <laughs> I got them locked down blues. <laughs> I'm not going to sing. That would be bad. <laughs> I've played a few instruments in my life, but th this one has never been that good to me. I've never I've never been able to master it. Okay. So, the trick with this is I'm saying here 
be patient and don't jump in. The thing, the instinct that we have a lot of the time is the second we see something we can fix, we try to fix it. Um, sometimes you don't even need to do that. You don't even want to do that because then you end up kind of just fixing random things. But if we don't know what the main problem is, what we need to do is like track it back to its source. Um, so I think that's the, the aim here is try to figure out what's actually making your code go badly. And this is a really, really vague step here, right? Because I don't have a simple way of saying to you, this is how you find out what's wrong. Again, as I was saying, no secrets. If there was a simple way to find this out, it would already exist and we'd all be using it. And so because there isn't, because you and I and everyone else in our infinite capability for imagination, it's not infinite, but you know, it's pretty good. Um, with our amazing imaginations, we can create a great deal of different kinds of code. And because we can create a great deal of different kinds of code, uh, that means that um, we can create a myriad of different kinds of problems. So this step's really vague, but the key is you want to find out where the problem started. You don't want to worry too much about the consequences of the problem. You want to dive all the way back in, if you can, and find the, the main root cause of the problem. So yeah, don't be patient. Actually, don't be patient. <laughs> Follow all of Mark's advice, even when he slips up and says the opposite of what he was thinking. Be patient. Don't jump in, right? Give yourself some time to think about what you're doing. And then look for the thing that's causing the problems, not the things that are the result of the problems appearing. Now, the obvious, <laughs> the obvious issue here is like step two didn't work. <laughs> of course, of course it didn't work. Um, every step I'm doing is kind of an escalation, right? So we couldn't find the problem. So this means that we have maybe written so much code in between our testing that um, the, the haystack is very large. So trying to find the needle in the haystack is very difficult. Um, I don't know if everyone's like familiar with that phrase, right? I, I hope it is like this, the, the idea of like trying to find a needle in a haystack. Haystack's a huge, huge pile of hay and a needle's a very small object. So trying to find that would be very difficult. Um, uh, and so that's the, the turn of phrase that I'm using here. So if you make it to step three, it means that the reset of the brain didn't necessarily get you anywhere. Thinking about the problem in terms of problem, not consequences, didn't get you anywhere. So now we're at the point where like, okay, things are getting really, really specific now. And so things are getting specific. There are things that we can do with our programs to try to um, basically reduce the search here. And like anyone who's been working with like algorithms, um, even just simple things like sorting algorithms or, um, or any kind of like search algorithms, like most AI is, is kind of search algorithms, right? It's like try to find the correct solution in a very, very large search space. You know, that's why we have a lot of AI algorithms. So one thing that we know, and we know this works, especially when we're doing sorting and stuff like that, is just split things, split things up, right? So you standard kind of binary approach to things is go, okay, um, we're going to do we're gonna sort half the list and we're gonna sort the other half of the list separately, you know? Or we're just gonna pivot on some random point and go, this is now in two pieces and we're gonna do them separately. We can do this with our brains as well. We can do this with our code. We can say to our code, I'm gonna split you up between different parts and I'm gonna test each of these parts separately because what we're trying to do is we're trying to reduce the amount of code we're testing back down to the meat brain limit. Five to nine, right? Five to nine objects. What, is it? what does that even mean? Five to nine objects. Um, it obviously means something, but um, finding out what the actual limit is, is a, is a practical thing. So you're gonna have to actually kind of get into the idea of the practicality of this. So things that we can do to make this work, split up your program into parts. Um, what I often do when I'm trying to debug stuff like this is I split my program up into stuff that I know works and stuff that I know um, is recent or more, more, more volatile. So it's kind of like separate into known working and edited recently. 
the reason why we know something is known working is because we're running unit tests on different parts of our code. I always joke about this as well because I'm just like, yeah, because when we write our code, we're always writing unit tests for every single separate function that we write. Yeah, yeah. When I do this in person, I always like to look around because there's a bunch of, bunch of people who will like grin and just be like, yeah, sure. What's a unit test? <laughs> it's like, there's a reason why these things exist. They're pretty handy. Um, it's a way to kind of say, if we only test some small portions of our code at a time, we can verify that some things are mostly working. I'm never going to say something's working. I'm going to say mostly working. Um, but at least if we're unit testing something, we can say it works under the conditions that we tested it in. Um, and if we have enough conditions we've tested something in, we can put it to the side and say this is known working. We're not going to look for our error here. And so what we're doing is we're taking this massive chunk of code. So you can have like, I don't know, let's say like a small program only has like say a thousand lines of code or something like that. But at least, and a thousand lines of code is way above our five to nine things that we can look at at a time. Even if that's separated out into like a lot of functions, a lot of like object oriented encapsulation and stuff like that, um, that's still going to be more than five to nine parts. Um, what we need to do is separate some of those parts out and say, this is a really simple bit of code. Uh, this bit of code here, all it does is it prints out the output. Let's throw that in another function, shift that off somewhere else and not look at it. You know, and so what we're trying to do is we're trying to like chop pieces off our code. So the only things that we're going to look at to, to really look for where the error is, is either stuff that we've edited recently or stuff we have not tested sufficiently. Um, the only problem that you may find is when the entire thousand lines of code is we haven't tested it separately um, and we've edited it recently. Um, that happens when we do, I don't know if anyone else does it, when you pull, you pull the all nighter and you, oh, I'm just going to write all this code in one night. And then you start thinking different. You start thinking really differently, and you start um, uh, you start writing code without writing the structure around it. That's going to give you like a, a good viewpoint on it. So you don't write tests, you don't separate things into functions and stuff like that, and then you just end up building this monolithic kind of thing. And then the sun comes up, and you go, "All right, let's go to bed." wake up the next day and you look through your code and it's like, I cannot separate this into known working and edited recently. I cannot run unit tests because I was so kind of like in the zone or whatever that I just wrote all this stuff and it didn't really, like, I tried to pile too much on at once. Um, and I think that's like one of the, one of the ways that we actually create a lot of bugs is by doing that. But anyway, anyway, if we can get to a point where, and then that's where you actually have to start going in. You start running unit tests. You start writing unit tests and stuff, and you start separating things. You can then focus your attention on the parts that are more suspect, right? And so that way we can get a good look at our code and we can say, I'm pretty sure that out of our thousand lines of code, the thing that's causing the problems is within this hundred lines of code. And we know, because we can, we can look back here um, and say, identifying the problem and all these consequences, we can see the consequences. The consequences are in certain lines of code. That's not necessarily where we're looking. We can look in certain lines of code, but what we're looking for is where is the problem being caused? That is not always where the error comes up. The error might be just a consequence, not the problem itself, right? So if we can say out of these thousand lines of code, these hundred lines are suspect, we can actually start sort of going through that in detail and saying, okay, we think that these errors that are popping up in all these other parts of the code, um, they're being caused by our code here. And, and I think this is like kind of the point also here where we start thinking about using debuggers and things. I can't remember whether that's this point or the next point. No, I don't think that's the point. I, I just, uh, <laughs> just give away the next slide, but Think about using interactive debuggers as well. So um, GDB is decent. Um, I see a lot of people using Visual Studio Code, the Visual Studio debugger with breakpoints and stuff like that um, is super handy as well. Trying to pull apart your program so that you can see exactly what it's doing, pretty handy. Um, getting to learn how to use those is pretty useful. I can't remember which um, courses is teach are teaching that. Uh, Alex, you were telling me about this, right? Um, 2511 or 2521? I feel like it would be 2521. Um, had a um, had some teaching on GDB. 
Um, if you want to use the Visual Studio uh, VS Code debug, I actually don't know. I've used the Visual Studio debugger, but not the VS Code one. I assume it's the same thing. Um, if you want to use that, um, you, do, you don't really even need to get training for that. It's a pretty self-explanatory thing. I think it's just practice with that one, and you, you'll be able to use it. So um, check that, because you can... Oh, Alex is saying 2521. Yeah. You can actually get down to this portion of code that you know does or doesn't work. That's where you put your breakpoint. You find out what's happening in there. You look at what the variables are doing um, as you're running. I don't want to go into too much detail on that kind of stuff because that's not what I'm talking about today. I'm talking about your mental process when you get to these things. So I'm like, I'm kind of at a step further removed from the nitty gritty details of doing things. I think that the the nitty gritty details of doing things are things that you want to learn by doing, not just by listening to me. Okay, okay. So, <laughs> Chicken wants to know if you've been looking after yourself. Sorry, I'm covering up some of the text there. And the trick is here, wait, 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 what was the problem? So if we've hit this point, maybe we're not sure about what we're doing. And so the question I have for you is, how far over, in over your head are you? And this is the point where we say, why are we writing this code? Like, why are we doing what we're doing? I don't want this to get like fully, fully existential. I love how like... I love how bluesy we're getting here. It's like, why, why are we even here? Man, why are we doing this? Anyway, question is, do you remember what your code was supposed to do? And do you remember why the code you have exists? <laughs> and then the question, the question I have here, when was the last time you ate or slept? Chicken would like you to take care of yourself. That's why I've got this slide here and she has a little concerned face there. So the concern faces for you and is saying, do you know why you're here? Because if we've hit this point, let me, let me go back to this one. If you can't remember why you're writing code, you're just like, I just need this function. And it's like, what for? And it's like, oh, I can't remember, you know, like, it's like, okay. Okay, if you can't remember why you're writing that function, then what are the odds that you're gonna write it correctly? Do you remember why this program needs to exist? I mean, sometimes it's easy. Sometimes it's like, this is the assignment. This is the part of the spec that I'm working on. I need this to perform this function. It's like, okay, good. But let's look a little further ahead than that. Like who's gonna get that kind of detailed specification when they're actually out working and stuff. And plenty of assignments and just, you know, pretty early on once you get past like the early stages of a of a computing degree it's going to be like oh no i wrote this spec myself and it's like i i have an idea about what i want to code but why does it exist what goal is it is it trying to do um and so this is the other question here have you written perfectly functional code that doesn't solve the initial problem <laughs> and as alex said before stop calling us out mark i'm calling you out again here have you written perfectly functional code that does not solve the initial problem? And I'm going to say yes, because I've done that so many times, and I'm sure you've done that so many times as well. Um, you write code, it compiles, um, and then you look at the code and you go, this does exactly what I want it to do. But then you go back and you look at your plans, the algorithm that you wrote up on a whiteboard or something like that, and you go, this is not the same thing. Why? Why are we not doing the same thing? And it's like such a human thing to get distracted and, and especially, especially yourselves. So I assume that the people here, we've got about 50, 47 people here right now, are people who um, are programming because they enjoy programming or at least they're programming because they've, they've chosen it. You've chosen it as, as the thing that you wanna learn right now, you know? So this is the thing that you're working on. So you go, okay. Um, I enjoy writing code, which means that I don't necessarily enjoy uh, algorithms. I don't necessarily enjoy writing or like deciphering specifications. What I love is coding, so I write code. And then you're you're the perfect candidate for someone who who starts writing code, looks at something, and goes, "Oh, how cool is that? 
how cool is this bit of code? I could rewrite this bit of code to be even cooler. And then you go, oh, how cool is it? I could, I could implement this code to do this thing, and it's really cool. And then, like, you're just, like, following cool things. And then, like, eventually, you, you hit a point where you're like, I don't know why I'm here anymore, but my code is really cool. And so you've got this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful stuff, um, and it works, but you've, you've, you've swum away from the specifications. And specifications back there in your past somewhere. It was the trigger to get you started. Um, but now you're, you're, you're off, and you're, you're somewhere else. So when I say step away from the computer for a second, what I'm saying is a significant amount of programming is thinking. It's not coding, it's thinking. So when I talk about programming, I'm talking about we are solving problems and we're using code to solve those problems. And you see how I separate those things, right? We are solving problems and we're using code to solve those problems. You have to have the concept of a solution first before you start coding, and then you know what to code. The coding is the final piece, right? So we've already decided what we're going to do, and then the program is like, the, the physicality of it. So this is like, let me say I'm going for a bushwalk. I'm not going for a bushwalk because I'm locked inside my apartment. But if I was going for a bushwalk, first thing I would do is I say, okay, where are we starting? Um, what supplies do we need? How long are we going to be out there for? Um, uh, my, are my shoes okay? Um, let's look at some maps. Let's figure out how far we're going to go, how far we're going to go per day, all this kind of stuff. And then eventually... We would go out there, maybe drive out to where we're going and stuff, and then and then actually take our, put on our bags and go for this walk, right? Um, coding's like that as well. You don't just drop yourself off in a forest um, and start walking. <laughs> Turns into like a bear grill situation there. Like you'll be drinking your own piss in no time, right? So we don't want to do that. We don't want to code by drinking our own piss. So we're not going to do that. We're not going to just jump into our code immediately. We're going to prepare ourselves and know where we're going. That is, I just, I just got to pause for a second. I think that is the best analogy I've ever used in a lecture. <laughs> I want that quoted. Mark Chi said, we're not going to code by drinking our own piss. <laughs> but it is like that right and we know this you know you do this a lot right you go oh i want to solve this problem so you just hop straight into an ide or something and you start coding and it's like what are you doing like that's like that's like headless chicken coding right you have not decided what you're going to do how you're going to do it you've just started writing code um and a lot of that code is just going to end up getting thrown away right so this is the point where i say step away from the computer if you understand what the problem is um, you should write down how you're going to solve this problem in human words, or you should draw a diagram of how you're going to solve this problem. This is why heaps of people, like, you look in any tech office, I don't know how many people have, um, uh, how, how many people have done, like, internships and stuff like that, or even just interviewed for internships, or gotten to just visit the company. So we're in a nice nice place in computer science where the companies like us you know they they like good computer science graduates so they're going to constantly be coming to campus to try to uh, recruit people to join their companies um, if you look in in these companies and you look into people's offices and stuff like that look at the amount of surface area in all these offices which is whiteboards um, around working spaces so you know the working spaces are going to have computers in them like we expect that because we're going to do all our work on computers but at the same time look how much space is set aside for um for people to be able to think visually with um with drawing or writing tools um and that's because this is super important if you're coding and you have like a whiteboard next to you. I don't like, what am I pointing? I'm pointing at a, at a wardrobe mirror at the moment. But if you have something like that, I actually use a second monitor and I do my drawings digitally because that way they're saved somewhere and it's easier to, to do it. I remember <laughs> I taught at a, uh, at a place where people used to write on a whiteboard. They'd write, please don't rub this out. And I'm like, don't do that. 
don't do that. That is so unsafe. Like, if it's your private office, you can just go, yeah, no one's going to rub this out. That's fine. <laughs> but if you're in a shared space, you can't just write in a whiteboard. Please do not rub this out. And it's like, if I'm going to go in there and teach, I'm going to rub this out. I apologize. <laughs> Imagine seeing that in a tutorial room and just being like, does that mean our tutor can't teach today because they don't have a whiteboard? Anyway, the idea is... Um, if you know what the problem is and you know how you're going to solve the problem, then it's easier for you to write the code. Yeah. And it's easier for you to not get caught up in that trick of writing code that, um, that is just you having fun. And, and I, I just also want to say having fun with writing your code is a really great thing to do. And you should definitely do that. It's, it's really good. Like, cause if you start to enjoy your code, um, you are going to write better code. Um, but if you start getting carried away with your code, you're going to write code that wasn't actually what you'd planned to do in the first place. So make a good plan, stick to it. Um, we all know plans have to change, right? But that's why it's a whiteboard. You rub stuff out you change it and you go, okay, we'll go back and try it again. You know? So this is, this is where it is. Make sure that you have built up. So, so this whole thing is not actually all of these questions of like, do you remember what the problem is? Uh, this is me trying to say, build up a good idea of what the problem is. Build up a good idea of what your solution is. Then, when you're looking at your code and trying to find out what's wrong, right? So the idea is like, what's wrong with my code? You don't know what's wrong with your code unless you had a recipe for what was right in your code, you know? So if you have your whiteboard, your piece of paper and stuff, or even just a document, uh, like a digital document where you've been writing your notes and stuff like that, you can look at that and go, we're supposed to do this, then we're supposed to do this, then we're supposed to do this. Then you look at your code and you go, does this code do this step? Yeah, looks like it does. Does this code do this step? Yeah, looks like it does. Does this code do this step? What? What is that code? Why, why are we doing this now? The next step was supposed to be this and stuff. And then you go, okay, right. You know, and this is better than just saying, okay, I need a... I don't know, an assignment that implements... What are they doing in 1511 at the moment? Was it Minesweeper? I, I think I'm not actually in 1511 this term, but I think they're doing Minesweeper or, or one of those, you know, those assignments. We go, okay, make Minesweeper. And you go, all right, I'm just going to make Minesweeper. And then you forget. It's like, no, no, I'm up to this point. I should be doing this thing now. It's not about, like, make Minesweeper. It's like, look at this array and find out what numbers are in these particular positions in this array so that we can calculate the next thing. You know, if you've got that written down at that level, you can follow it, right? And then you know whether your code is working or not, because again, each of those steps, back down to that cognitive load problem, five to nine lines of code, right? If you're down to five to nine lines of code, which each of those steps should be not that much code, then you can actually look at it and go, does this small amount of code do what this concept is? And so breaking things down into like, uh, into a program plan, in a sense, allows you to be kind of, to get closer to that idea. You know what I said at the beginning, we're trying to verify that our implementation matches our specification. If our specification's detailed enough and we wrote it, um, then we can actually look at a line of text and compare it to like five, six lines of code and go, yes, that matches. Then another one, yeah, that matches, and back and forth. And it's the same thing that we talk about sometimes where you code in your comments. So you write your comments before your program or like with the structures of your program, you write it all together. Um, and then your, your comments always kind of giving you the information on like, okay, what's this next bit supposed to do? And it's pretty handy because if someone reads it afterwards, they're like, ah, oh, yeah, okay. Follow what they were saying there. Okay. <laughs> so... <laughs> Everyone loves my memes, right? Um, but but maybe we're stuck. Maybe none of this stuff has helped. So has nothing worked? Can't find the bugs. Ah, oh, but we use Mark's techniques. Okay, okay, good. We've got a brain reset and all this stuff, but we still can't find them. Oh, we can't get it working, right? This is going to happen. Um, as I said, this process is an escalating process. For some of your bugs, you're already you're already done by now. You you followed what I've said, and you've you've got yourself out. But um, at other times you haven't necessarily. And so then we need to, we need to start going deeper. Um, what I might do is take a quick break, mainly because I forgot to fill up any water. So I'm just talking without water at the moment and I can feel my throat is just like going. <sighs> so let's take, man, I haven't played in a long time.
Oh yeah, that was a bit out of shape. <laughs> anyway, I'll be back in a moment. Um, it won't be long. It's not going to be like a five minute break or anything. I'm just going to fill up my water and come back and we shall continue. Alright, sort of back. You know, I was really looking forward to doing this in person. <laughs> Not even allowed to leave my house right now. Um, one thing that I that I miss, and it, it's something that I think people probably wouldn't, wouldn't really notice that much, is that a lot of us um, who are lecturers are... Um, we do a lot of things that performers do. I mean easier for me because like I've literally been a performer but um what we will often do is um look at everyone's faces so I would do that I would I would look at everyone's faces in the crowd while I, while I was playing and stuff like that because it's, it's easy to do when you're playing an instrument um and and you feed back off that um and in lectures I used to do that a lot right I I used to like look at people and like see whether people are like falling asleep or whether people are like looking away or whether they're looking intently at you and stuff and you kind of gauge the room like that and try to figure out whether what you're doing is hitting home or not i was really looking forward to doing that um because i figured with like you know it was like 40 people right so this wasn't going to be a huge thing we could all fit in one lecture theater under the old um uh, under the old social distancing rules as of two weeks ago, but, um, it's a bit sad that we had to take this online, but it does mean that within 20 minutes of starting, I could decide to play the lockdown blues. <laughs> we could do something silly like that. I feel like we have to, we have to do that, right? We've got to make up for it somehow. So you're going to get random stuff like that <laughs> instead. I have a feeling like me not lecturing this term and just streaming his instead has made me much looser. But anyway, okay, back to where we were up to. So, we're stuck. First steps I've given you haven't helped. Right, that happens. It, it totally happens because the first steps I've given you are the easy ones. Like, get a reset, go back to your specification, um, you know, go back through your error messages. I think a lot of people are gonna do some of these steps instinctively. I actually think that the, the biggest step that's gonna help you in this one, well, there's two. One is know when to take a break. <coughs> and the second one is um, make sure you've got a clear idea of what you were supposed to do so you can compare it against what you actually did. Um, so if I'm not gonna, if I'm gonna give you just like, you know, just single points of things, then, then those things are pretty useful. But Say none of that stuff worked. Now we need to, um, we need to start, you know, delving down into the problem solving. So I've got two steps here, step five and six, which is also 5A and 5B because these aren't sequential. You could take either one of these depending on what your problem looks like to you, or you could just randomly pick one first and then look at the other. So let's look at the particulars. So 5A is zooming in. Um, it's zooming into particular little things, um, and we should only do this if we're really clear on the big picture. So this is kind of what I was hinting at last time, is if we have a good plan for what we are doing, we can start going through and, and picking apart at our program and saying, is it doing exactly what we wanted it to do? So this is where I'm going, do you know how to use an interactive debugger? Um, it's good to get a handle on these things, it's good to start learning how to use them. Um, I know that like if you've only been in like comp 1511 with me, um, we didn't go into interactive debuggers because we just didn't have time. There's too much content we're trying to teach as it is. Don't want people to have to learn another piece of software on top of things. And um, also don't like, I don't like throwing GDB at beginners. 
<laughs> it's like, was this written for humans? Or was this like written for the machine and humans have to be trained in how to use it? Because this looks like it was written for the machine's benefit. And like, machine didn't need that benefit, but it was totally like written for the machine's benefit. And humans have to, have to like wrap our meat brain around the binary brain concepts, right? Like I find that happens a lot. Um, the older you go back in computer science, the less things are human centric and the more things are machine centric because machines can't change as easily, you know, like well, back then. Now, now we can modify them much more easily. So there's, there's a lot of stuff. So I, that's how I can kind of look at the difference between GDB and the Visual Studio debugger where like Visual Studio, I'm just like, just, just use it. You'll probably figure it out. It's not, it's not super easy, but if you can code, you'll probably be able to figure that one out. Um, whereas GDB is like, no, take some time. <laughs> take some time to learn it and practice it. It is still worth learning, um, but it's not something that you can just learn easily. So have a look at it, try it. Because what these interactive debuggers are gonna allow you to do is pause your code. So you're gonna be able to step through one instruction at a time. So it's like, okay, run this line of code, run this part of this line of code, then run the other part of this line of code. And at each point you can say, okay, stop now. I want to look at what the state of my program is now. So you can stop at some point, you look in your memory and you go, oh, these variables say this right now, these variables say this, this memory is initialized, this memory is leaking, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. And so you can pause it at any point in time and go, okay, this is the current state of the program. You can step through it. And that way what you can do is you can verify you had a plan for what your program was supposed to do. Algorithmical plan. We do this, then we do this, then we do this. Um, the, um, the interactive debugger allows you to walk through your program and you can verify it in motion, whether it is doing what, um, what your plan said. One caveat should, I, I don't know how many people are working on this at the moment. I know that when you're learning, you don't do this so much, but anything multi-threaded, your debug is not going to help you. Well, I mean, <laughs> it's not not going to help you, but a significant amount of problems with um, with any kind of multi-threaded programming are concurrency issues. Um, and concurrency issues come up when we get race conditions between two threads trying to work on the same data at the same time. That's it's not all cases, but you know, like a lot of cases are like that. If your interactive debugger pauses one thread and lets the other one go until it stops at a natural point, um, they're no longer in the sync that maybe causes that issue. So I've seen plenty of times where we're just working with things, we've got multiple threads running on our CPU and stuff like that. Um, and, and the thing's broken. It's, it's totally broken. <laughs> like It's like, this is not even remotely doing what we want it to do. Um, let's start debugging it. You start debugging it and everything works, right? Sometimes that can give you the blues. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot to pick up the guitar again. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, that's the only caveat, but don't worry about that too much. I think when you've got concurrency issues, you've got bigger problems, um, and you kind of maybe want to go back to unit testing and stuff and make sure all your components are working and then figure out whether you've got locks that aren't unlocking or opening at the right time and things. But, you know, those of you who are getting deeper into that kind of coding, you can, yeah, you'll have to have, you'll have to learn a different set of tricks there. But anyway, I still, I still highly suggest interactive debugger. Um, oh, as Zach is saying there, if you're using Clang um, and DCC, then LLDB is decent as well. He's saying that you might get some extra debugging info out of that. Okay, so this is the idea that we check our code against our documented algorithm. So this is why I say we're getting into the nitty gritty because what we're doing here is like, we're running our code and we're looking at our, our algorithm and our specification step by step and we're going, are these both working? You know, so this is if we can't just kind of scan the whole thing and see it, or we can't just kind of go, these bits of code work, these bits of code don't, so we're only going to look at the code that doesn't work. This is like, no, we're just going to go through the whole program, <laughs> you know? So we're, we've hit a point where um, the only way that, that we think we can solve this problem is to manually run the program. And I don't want you to manually run the program with your meat brain, because the meat brain is going to make mistakes. Um, so we want to run it manually using the interactive debugger where the computer is implementing the rules. 
Um, so if we can do this, we will most likely be able to find the problem because what you do is you step through and you go, all right, at line 850, the variables got set to this. And we go look at our plan and plan says, okay, the variables should be this at this point. You know, they should hold the values of the, the X and Y coordinates of the, the place we're in. And then you look at the variable and the variable says negative 2 million something or other. And you go, that is, that's not weird. I mean, that, sorry, that is weird. <laughs> or, or it says NAN or something, not a number. And you're like, oh, we've screwed up here. There's an uninitialized variable or something. You should be able to catch those more easily, but it's going to sometimes be more subtle than that, right? But at least what you'll be able to do then is you go through and you say what things should be, then what they really are, and then you find your issue. Um, I say that this is, you know, the slowest and most manual bit because it's like literally you're stepping through the code one bit at a time. And when you think about how many instructions per second our, our computer is doing, like this is like expanding... Um, a quarter of a second worth of processing and it's going to take you like two hours to go through but if you got to this step you might need it so it's still important um so yeah learning how to use this is this 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 slide's really just learn how to use an interactive debugger if you have one available um different actually haven't haven't done much dev in a lot of other languages to see what other kind of interactive debuggers there are i know when we used to use eclipse for java there was a debugger in that um, but I actually don't know if anyone, if any of the, if there's anyone in chat who knows, um, what kind of debuggers people use also for things like Python and stuff like that, that might be handy. Um, I don't know if Python actually has its own built-in way of like running and pausing your program and stuff like that. Um, I'm really kind of super, super rusty on Python anyway, but okay. So this is something you might have to do, um, go through bit by bit and this step um, is the one step that you'll probably learn elsewhere um, so I, I, I include it in my list of things to do because it is definitely part of the cognitive process um, but a lot of the time when people say learn how to debug this is the thing they will teach you so this is language specific um, Josh is saying PyCharm is great and IDEs tend to have their own debuggers built in which is good um, yeah so this is the one where if you're if you're learning a technical um, debugging process, which will be language specific, so heaps of your courses are probably going to teach this kind of thing. Um, this is where you'll learn something like interactive debugging, which is like step by step, check everything, check your memory and stuff like that as you go. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing. So the first one was zooming in. When we're zooming in, we're like kind of looking at um, precisely our own code. You know, we're really, really focused on our own code. But maybe, maybe the other way we can do is we open it right back out instead. And we say, let's not looking at our own code. Maybe our own code is not, um, is not what we're looking for here. Toby's asking if there are any comp courses that teach how to use an interactive debugger. Um, I know 2521 people have been saying teaches GDB at some point. There's a, there's an extra lab that teaches GDB. Um, I can't remember. I know I know Kevin wrote something. Kevin Elfenstein, one of the um, lecturers, he teaches uh, operating systems, has a, um, a debugging, an, like an online debugging tutorial. I can't remember the link to it. I don't know if anyone, because I think this came up like last year or the year before someone was talking about it. Um, that might be handy. Um, and that might have stuff like this, how to use an interactive debugger in it. Um, I'm not sure, I haven't gone through it. It's sort of like, I hear about lots of things that people are doing, but I don't necessarily have the time to actually run them all. But anyway, anyway, so that was like the focusing in, really, really introspective, looking at your own code, um, very time consuming, but often very, very useful. But widening our view, maybe our code's not the problem. I mean, our code's always the problem, <laughs> but maybe we can get help elsewhere, right? Um, 2521 Hayden did a lecture on GDB. Nick, yes, the link is Kevin and Liz Willis on, yeah, I knew, I know Liz was involved with that one. Um, you might not be able to post links, Nick. <laughs> um, 
one of the CSC soccer people may be able to post a link. Apparently, I'm able to post a link as well. Maybe they made me a moderator. Um, <laughs> everyone's like putting the arrow up. I think this is the link Mark is talking about. Only you're not allowed to post links. Um, someone send me that link via Discord and then I'll post it just to make sure that the link actually happens. I'm on... Um... Yeah. If you're on the, 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 the Mark on Mondays Discord, you could post the link there. Or the CSC Sock Discord, let me check. Check in general. <laughs> I'm just looking at CSE like Discord. <laughs> Mark Chi, we're not going to code by drinking our own piss. <laughs> um, if someone could ping that link on one of those Discords, then I can... Oh, wait, Nick Sims has moderator now. Nick, could you post the... Wait, here we go. Here we go. I've got it now as well, in case I get there before, before Nick does. There is a link to... Um, uh, Kevin and Liz's, uh, debugging thing, which, um, I, on I only skimmed it, but it looked pretty useful, so that might be something handy to look at. Yeah, so Nick and I have both posted it. Alright, so, so that's the, the, the focusing in. Let's, let's look at the focusing out. Uh, thinking around the problem, um, we can look for help. So, <laughs> you can tell my, <laughs> my attitude towards Stack Overflow. Yes, we can look for help on Stack Overflow. I do that with a question mark and a laugh afterwards because when we look stuff up on Stack Overflow, we get a combination of things. Um, there's like, it's nearly like we could do a profile of the different people who are going to answer you on Stack Overflow. So the majority of us who use Stack Overflow are going to um, log on to Stack Overflow, type in something to search, and then read whatever's there. It takes a different kind of person to actually post something on Stack Overflow. So either you're posting a question, and I'll often only post a question if like extensive amount of searching has, um, has um, ooh, are we? No, no, all good. My OBS just went down to zero kilobits upstream, and I got really freaked out for a second that I was just talking to the void. Um, hopefully it's okay, yeah. It may have paused for a second there. So, the, the kind of things that you're going to get in Stack Overflow is someone saying, um, you're all wrong, there is only one right way to do this, and it is via this arcane specification, and you must do this, this, and this, and you look at it, it's not even readable code, and you're just like, what, why are you here? You know, are you here just to show off that you know old stuff? Um, yeah, Alex saying there was a bit of a lag spike. Hopefully it's not too bad. Hopefully you didn't... I'm making fun of Stack Overflow, so you didn't... Stack Overflow is having its revenge by DDoSing me or something. <laughs> anyway, either that or you're going to get people um, answering the question in the wrong language. <laughs> or just, just random stuff. Or just like a big argument. Or someone just saying something stupid like you shouldn't even be using that language for that. Um, use this instead and it's like that's not going to solve my problem I'm stuck in this language because the whole rest of the code base is in this language I, I still need this to work you know um, so I find that the quality of answers you can get in Stack Overflow needs to be filtered you need to think about um, the fact that a lot of people are answering questions in Stack Overflow to make themselves look smart um, other people are answering questions on Stack Overflow when they don't know the answer they're just writing things on the internet because they saw it there and like heaven forbid that that's not <laughs> how the whole internet works of people just writing stuff on the internet with no clue of what's going on so we have to take stack overflow with a pinch of salt every now and then you are going to get something good out of it though <laughs> and yeah ben saying this is a duplicate of insert totally unrelated problem here yeah so again again this is systematic systematic systemic <laughs> Neither of those words are correct for what I'm trying to say here. This is part of the same problem that I'm talking about from the beginning of this talk. The meat brain does not understand the silicon brain very well. 
So the meat brain is like, oh, I think it's this. Oh, I'm just gonna hook on to some kind of weird relationship I have with those keywords, and then I'm just gonna post something. Uh, and, um, and, and we're gonna get a lot of that on Stack Overflow, because Stack Overflow is a whole bunch of meat brain output. And as, we, as we've seen already, and we've been talking about here, the meat brain's not good at debugging. So if you ask other meat brains to debug, they may not necessarily have a better process than you. If you're lucky, they've been through it before and they can go, okay, here was the, here's the answer that, that I came up with for this. And so maybe it's okay. So, you know, yeah. Um, what are we saying? Nick is saying far more helpful can be specific forums for a particular language tool. Yeah, so when we say uh, look for help here, maybe you're not looking for help um, on Stack Overflow. Maybe you're looking help on, for help on other places. Nearly every kind of, especially niche programming languages and stuff like that, are going to have a community. So whether they've got their own forum or their own Discord or, the, or something like that, you may be able to find that. Param saying the language thing is so true. You ask one thing and people are like, don't do that, use language blah instead. Where's Zach? Is Zach going to tell me to use Rust for everything again? <laughs> I know, I'm just making fun of you, Zach, because I know that you're watching at the moment. <laughs> okay. When you are looking for things... Try to make sure you know what you're looking for. So what keywords are you going to search? Is there particular error codes coming up that you want to search? Sometimes they can be useful, sometimes they have like nearly no meaning, but sometimes the meaningless error codes, um, someone else on the internet has posted, I got this error code and I got it from doing this. And then sometimes that's worth something because then you can say, if I got that error code from doing such and such, um, I got it from doing something different than that person, but there's some similarity between the two. That little overlap might give you a clue that, um, that that's where the problem is. So sometimes that works. But what keywords, and the keywords, this is the reason you're in university, it's because the only thing that we're going to teach you at university is what the keywords mean. <laughs> I joke. I joke. But occasionally, occasionally, we are going to teach you stuff and we're going to say things like, this means this. And this means this. And you're like, oh my god, why do I have to memorize why something means something? And then you go, what am I going to Google? And you go, oh, that's why I'm going to memorize what that name is. Uh, it's going to make my Googling quicker. So sometimes it makes sense. So knowing what you're going to search is important. Um, the other thing that's interesting is read your old code. Um, if you're coding something, chances are you've done something similar previously. That's not always the case, but chances are. Going back over your old stuff, because I like your old stuff better than your new stuff. Um, <laughs> uh, just quoting song lyrics from bands from the 90s again, which no one's going to know. Uh, <laughs> sometimes you'll realize that you've done something differently this time than previously. So if you're doing something differently than... Um, than, uh, than your old code, you have to ask yourself, why did I change my structure? I had a structure before that worked for this kind of problem, and now I'm doing it differently. Am I doing it differently because I learned something new and I don't fully understand it? That's okay. You know, it's totally okay to do that. Am I doing it differently because this is the structure my team is using, and I just need to wrap my head around it? Totally fine as well. Those are good things to do. That's broadening your horizons. But it's like, I'm doing it differently because I wasn't thinking about what I was doing. <laughs> And, and while on the surface this looks like these are both going to do the same thing, am I sure of that? Hey, maybe that'll help. Um, the other thing, thinking around the problem, let your subconscious solve the problem. This is step one, again. <laughs> I go back to step one a bit. Um, step away, again, try to get your brain to reset. Zach was saying, it looks like you're having a memory issue. Would you like to rewrite your entire code base in Rust? <laughs> Thanks, Zach. <laughs> That's not the first time he's said that to me. <laughs> the other thing, the other thing, and this is a, this is a big one that a lot of people use is the rubber ducky or a tolerant friend. <laughs> like, I like doing the tolerant friend bit. Um, especially if your tolerant friend knows coding, but they've got to be tolerant, right? They've not actually got to be someone who's not going to, to try to help. Like they've actually got to sit back and let you talk. Um, this is why the rubber ducky is so good. So I've got, I've got my artistic rubber ducky here, which is my funk, my, my Bob Ross Funko Pop. Um, he's a bit dusty. Look at that. <laughs> You're going grey, Bob. I mean, he did. So, you know. Anyway, talking to something, even if it can't talk back, is really helpful. And this is actually really similar to the step four that I was talking about, of, like, knowing what your problem is in your specification. Um, talk to it about your problem. 
And like, like, let's let's not get too deep here, because if you really need to talk to someone about your problems, then go see your GP, um, get an appointment with a therapist, talk to your therapist about your real problems. But if we're just talking about our code problems, um, the rubber ducky can be pretty handy. We can say to them, I think the code's supposed to do this, and I think it's supposed to do this. Um, the problem is it's doing this, and I don't really know why it's doing this, but then you start to achieve clarity as soon as you can start to just kind of have to formalize what's happening. So if you have to explain what's happening, you might actually learn a lot more about what's going on. Uh, Alex is saying, I swear as soon as I decide to rant about a bug to someone, I debug it in five minutes. Because this is something that we have to, again, again, super and super important. The whole purpose of this talk today is how to get your meat brain working to um, um, to debug because the silicon brain can do it in its own way actually the silicon brain doesn't debug at all silicon brain just looks at our code and just goes I'm going to run exactly what you want but the meat brain's not good at it and the rubber ducky allows us to formulate something so the weird thing about it is performing ideas sets them in our minds in particular ways so me talking to you now I'm actually coming up with ideas as I'm giving you this talk, which is which is funny, right? Because you've got my script. <laughs> it's not an exact script, but it's written the way I talk, the, the handout. You can see my slides. The slides have certain words in them, yet I'm saying something different because as I'm saying it, I'm coming up with ideas. As I speak these things, the ideas solidify in my mind into things that are coherent to me, that make sense to me. The rubber ducky technique works like that as well. When you start talking about things, the ideas start to form in your mind in a way that they weren't happening when you were just talking about it in your own head. It's really, really weird. Um, but obviously it's like awkward as well, because like if you're in like in a lab and there's other people working there and you start talking out loud, they're going to be like, can you, can you maybe not do that? <laughs> like, I don't need to hear your debugging when I'm trying to do mine. Like, it's actually totally throwing me off. So be careful. Like, that's I said, a tolerant friend. But otherwise, actually talking about these things can really help. Um, and so that that's a way to, like, to, to get our understanding around things. Another thing that might happen, uh, and again, this, this reminds me of step... Oops. Of step 5A here, where it's, it's slow and manual um, and, and stuff like that. The other thing is question everything. Uh, is your old code still reliable in a new situation? So, again, again I want to say, how much do you trust your unit tests? And if you say, I trust my unit tests fully because I don't have any, then... <laughs> you can trust your unit tests only as far as they are checking certain parts of the problem domain. Right, so if if there are more possible problems that you haven't thought of because you have not checked your old code in a new situation yet then you need to make sure the old code's working sometimes the problem is in where are we in the known working bits which is which is rough um because if you've kind of if you think you've confirmed that some bits are working yet you end up all the way into this step here are you sure that those things are working maybe you've thrown yourself off and maybe you have put yourself in the wrong part of the haystack because you trusted another part of it that you hadn't tested fully so unit tests super handy so this is nearly like like the the the, the take homes from this talk is like take breaks make proper plans test things properly um which is basically what debugging is um zach <laughs> sounds like you my program is entirely perfect i haven't spotted a single bug via unit tests yeah and that's like when your unit tests are like one test per function <laughs> and they test like a really trivial trivial usage of it then that's what you're gonna get um i always joke about the old Ariane 5 disaster because i talk about that in 1511 as well so they had code that was working quite well um and it worked fine and then all they did was um install that code in a bigger rocket that had higher numbers for its telemetry data and then it snapped itself in half and exploded in the atmosphere so like <laughs> it's like oops <laughs> so know that your old code may be suspect under new conditions depending on how well you've tested it um it's something to think about 
These are kind of things that I will fall back on. So this list of things here is something I will look at when I've hit a point in my debugging and I've got no idea what's going on, you know? So I've hit a point where I was like, I can't fix it. I really don't know what's going on. Um, I'm now looking for external help. Bob Ross, give me some external help, <laughs> you know? Um, then I might reach this point. Usually I don't. Usually I'm just like, I tested this stuff, you know? I'm not going to start looking for the problem in stuff I've already tested. This is why this is the later step in the process, not an earlier step. Alex is saying my bugs don't exist, exist if I never test my code. <laughs> if a bug appears in your code and no one is there to test it, does it really exist? That's the, uh, the philosophy, the, the, the mystical philosophy of, uh, <laughs> of debugging and coding. If I never test my code, then then is it ever wrong? I don't think you can hear that. I was doing some finger tapping. <laughs> All right. Step seven. Start again. Uh, is he saying? Uh, oh, Zach is saying one five one one auto test is always there to test. <laughs> Yeah, so we may reach a point where there are no auto-tests written for our code. We may have to write our own at some point. And, and Izzy's also saying bugs don't exist if you don't <laughs> write any code. That is true. If you don't write any code, there won't be any bugs. Um, but even if you don't write any code and all you're doing is specifying things on a whiteboard or something, you can still have bugs in that. So, <laughs> here we are at step seven. This is kind of like the last, the last step. And, and as Alex is saying here, this is the rage quit solution. So I'm not, I'm not advocating this. I'm saying that this is more of a last resort. So here's my meme here. <laughs> this is how code should work. Unit test one passes, unit test two passes, 1800 errors, and then he just throws him out the window. <laughs> so let me, let me just say that if you've reached this point, then I, I understand, right? I, I hundred percent understand that we do hit this point. Um, and I have some techniques to use at this point, but I really, really want you to have exhausted everything else before you reach this, right? Um, because this is, these are like really, really major drastic solutions. So <laughs> what, are you, what are your options? Build a new project. I know, I know it's horrible. It's horrible, but sometimes, sometimes it happens. So sometimes you go, Okay, okay, okay. Let's all just sit back for a moment and we have a really good idea of how this works, right? We, we've we done step four to, to, to the nth degree. We know algorithmically exactly what's happening. Let's throw away the code. Let's throw away the code and start again. It's really like, I don't suggest this. It's a really bad idea, right? Because how much time are you going to lose doing that? Chances are a lot of your code works because you've written a fair bit of it along the way and tested it for other things. But, but what you can do is, instead of necessarily building the whole thing from scratch, when you start the new project, you find the code that is, is going weird in your project. You think that some code is going weird in your project. Bring that out into a different project without any of your other stuff around it. So remove all the rest of your infrastructure and just grab this one kind of function that is even like, cause at this point you probably have, wait, you've probably failed at this step. <laughs> so you know that you failed at this step and you're like, fine, I can't find the problem. So instead of looking for that step, we look for the consequences and we go, okay, let's see if we can cause the consequences. So what we're doing is we're grabbing our code that we think is the code that doesn't work and we're pulling it out and then testing it in isolation. Again, if you had good unit tests, you wouldn't have to do this. <laughs> am, I, am, I, am I hammering one of my points home well enough? <laughs> I've said it on every slide. Are you testing properly? <laughs> um, but we can do that. We can, we can take the code that is suspect, take it in isolation, and then see what it does. But really, we're going to have to go over this a fair bit and see what it does. But at least what we've done there is we've separated it from the rest of the infrastructure. 
And what we might find out here is the code works fine and the code in your original project works fine once you remove this thing and then you need to start looking at the interface between the two. Is there an API that they're working across to talk to each other? Is there some kind of specification of the communications between them? Have you done something really, really simple and just ordered the variables incorrectly in the function input? You know, that's a real hard bug to find sometimes. Because if the function... Is Sorry. Breaking things with my guitar. It's okay, the guitar didn't break. <laughs> Um, Zach's saying starting from scratch can actually be a huge brain technique in very specific circumstances uh, Mipsy went through a good uh, five to six solid rewrites it happens I mean like people talk about refactoring um, sometimes re going through and refactoring your code is a way to go through it all again and see it all again but anyway um, sometimes I, I want to say Sometimes there's less time burden in restarting, but not always, but it is often less than it feels like. Sometimes we get into this, um, this idea known as um, sunk cost fallacy, which is like we've put so much effort into something that we feel like um, we can't abandon it. Um, so, you know, if they're not treating you right, just break up with them. You, you need to get a fresh start. <laughs> Well, since my baby left me, <laughs> I've been so down and blue. <laughs> uh, I love giving relationship advice. It's um, um, I am in no position to give you relationship advice. I'm not an expert on relationships. <laughs> I, I'm just a lecturer <laughs> in computer science. You should only take my advice on computer science. I just wanted to say it because it popped into my head and it felt like fun. Um, so, sometimes restarting is worth it. Um, and, and I have these things in here just to call you out. I'm calling you out. Maybe write the code cleanly this time. Maybe, maybe this time when you do your full rewrite, use a style guide. Like, it doesn't have to be your own style guide. It can be someone else's style guide, but use it and use it really carefully and religiously. Use it so that when you go back through it, you're gonna be able to read this thing perfectly because it's got really, really clean style. And then maybe this time you build your unit tests into the development so that you know that this time um, you cannot compile this thing without it actually going through and questioning every function that you've written. And that way, maybe building it up like that, you're going to get, um, get better code that you're gonna get otherwise. Um, Um, is it, we came here for debugging minutes, so we got wisdom for life. Um, <laughs> Alex, sounds like a good idea, proceeds not to do it. Again, again, this is the, the biggest issue, I think, the biggest issue we're always going to get with debugging is, um, what's I'm going to call it, is the meat brain. It's not, it's not whether our code's going to work or not, it's whether we understand what's going on, or we can think about what we're going to do, or what processes we're going to use, at what time. So, this is the last step. So for me, I have when once I've reached this step, I've usually solved the problems. Um, I've either solved problems with this step or I've abandoned things. I mean, this is basically abandoning things and restarting, right? So there is no, there's no more debugging after this. You have not, you you've not debugged. You've <laughs> you've you've given up instead. So you've never found the bug. You've never removed the bug. You've just gone. This is over. We're gonna start from a clean slate. Um, so so this is where this ends, right? I can't give you debug information after you've hit step seven because if you hit step seven, you have decided that you are you're in a full abort and <laughs> there's no there's there's no there's no bug to be found because you've taken off and nuked the site from orbit. It's the only way to be sure. So we get we get to this point and we go, all right, are, are we debugging now? Have we have we reached the end? Um, you've reached the limit of my ideas because this this is my process. I go through all of these things. So where are we? First thing I do is try to get a mental reset. It doesn't involve walking away, it's just a reset, right? Um, this is actually a really, really good example 
of a mental reset. Um, playing music puts your brain into a completely different creative abstract space. I mean, programming is an abstract problem-solving space, but playing music is uh, a real-time flow space. And if you can get yourself into the flow playing music, that will actually pull you away from um, the sort of analytical side of debugging that you're going to do. So I could say that I planned this in advance and I wasn't just getting the guitar out for shits and giggles, but I was just getting the guitar out for shits and giggles. But this can really kind of just, just really, really put you in a situation where um, you can get your headspace correct. The things that we can do once we've got our headspace correct is like look for the problem itself. So we've got a lot of techniques to try to figure out um, one problem and trying to find the cause of an individual problem because hopefully you've only got one problem at a time in reality you've probably got multiple but if you can find at least one and solve it you can at least then kind of um, reduce the number of problems that are in your search space the other things that we talked about doing are um, making sure that we know what the plan was uh, making sure that we've actually written down a plan um, and making sure that we've got a, a, a clean algorithm you know that we know that we want to implement if you're just implementing without an algorithm then what are you implementing you know you just like I, I think that if I just keep you know modifying my code eventually the problem will be solved anyone seen bogo sort this is what bogo sort is I will randomly mod modify my problem without a plan and then every time I modify it's like it's a sorting algorithm where you randomize all the elements in a list and then you check if it's in order. And if it's in order, you are correct and you did an order one sort. It's the fastest sort ever. Or you randomize and it's not correct. And then again, you randomize, it's not correct. You randomize it again. And you end up with an, uh, an order infinity sort. So it's, it's quite a funny one. And we don't want to code like that. We want to code with a plan and a decision on what we're going to do. And then we write the code. So this step is to say... Um, this is very much the logical errors step in a sense it's like the code's not doing what we want it to do let's let's go and figure that out then we got down into like the really kind of like mechanical side of doing things um which is go through and find out exactly what your program is doing and fix the itty bitty pieces so focusing in on in this step at this line of the code, it should perform this task. And we look at that line and like the few lines before and afterwards and we analyze it and we look at it actually running and we go, does it actually work or not? Um, this is the thing that you can learn as a technical skill. Um, it's potentially one of the slowest ways to do it, but it is also one of the ways that I would say is the most sure way that's actually going to solve the problem because if you can see exactly what's going on, you know exactly what's going on. So this is again, taking the meat brain and pulling it one step back and saying, I'm not going to look at my code and say what my code does. Like I am, I'm not going to try to infer anything using the meat brain. I'm gonna use the silicon brain, the interactive debug, and it's going to tell me exactly what happened. Um, the other thing we can do is, this is very meat brain. Let's look outside. Um, let's, let's try to find a solution from outside our code. Um, other people maybe came up with the same problems. Um, this is the entire theory behind open source, in a sense. Open source, like, I think Linus Torvalds was talking about this years and years ago. Person who invented Linux, by the way. Um, that with enough eyes looking at a problem, um, a problem can be solved. So this was the idea that open source software meant that, you know, you can have hundreds of people, whether they're within or outside your company or whatever, all looking at the same piece of code and saying, we all care about this code we all have a vested interest in this code being good and being useful so um all of us going to look at it and someone's going to be able to find the bugs in this because we have so many eyes looking at it so it's an interesting approach it works a lot of the time it also means that you have a hundred different opinions on how something should work <laughs> but you know that's never been a problem before right <laughs> anyway yeah so other things that we can do like that is try to use our brain in a different way. So, subconscious, use the subconscious brain instead of the conscious brain. Uh, Robert Ducky, try to get the conscious brain to perform the idea of what's going on. So, all these kinds of things can come in handy. And then, and then we got to the, 
the I have no other answers <laughs> solution. This isn't this isn't just nuking everything. This isn't an RMRF as Tom was saying there. You can do this as just part of your debugging to say, all right, let's take this one particular function that we think might be suspect and you can take that from like step three before we were looking at identifying the problem and stuff and you go okay we've got these known goods and we have this one which is suspect we're not sure about how it interacts with everything else in the program and there's too much going on here pull that function out make an, a new project with just that function in it and enough other code around it to test whether it works or not and you go okay did this work strangely enough maybe you could write all of your code with that in advance and then you'll never have to reach this point because it'll automatically happen for you every time you co you compile. So, nice unit testing framework's pretty handy, isn't it? So yeah, that was like my me going back over the overview of what I did. Um, but there are other things that I think that we can definitely learn about. So I didn't even look at code reviews and stuff. So I was really, really specifically looking at debugging. But I think code reviews are one of the best ways um, to do debugging, except they're not. They're not debugging, it's kind of like, um, I, I always think about like a code review is like, if I don't want to debug my code, <laughs> but I'm going to convince someone else to debug my code, that's what I think of <laughs> in the code review. So I still think that like, um, we still need to learn how to debug because at some point we're going to code review someone else's code and then we're going to help them debug, but we can only do that if we know how to debug ourselves. So, so this one's not part of the debugging process, even though it's vitally important. Um, because um, it's just offloading the work onto someone else, which if you're in a good company is going to happen heaps. Like the whole point about joining groups together of people to work on things is we are greater than the sum of our parts, right? So I can write, I don't know, half decent code. Someone else can write half decent code. We look at each other's code and both of our code gets better than half decent. It's a, it's a good setup. It's going to work well. But the other thing that I wanted to talk about, and this is something that we need to remember because the way that we think about this psychologically, a lot of the time, the way we think about this psychologically is um, we think that debugging is not work. So sometimes we think of debugging as the thing that's stopping us from working. Anyway, we, we think of it as we do our work and then we have to debug it. And that idea already puts a seed of doubt in our minds that, that there's some magical world somewhere where you write code and you don't debug it. Um, and that doesn't exist. And, and so that's why I wanted to say this at the end is something that we, that we need to think about, that debugging is part of the work. In fact, it's probably the majority of the work so we always think about this idea like you know and when you're learning you all have to debug heaps but when i get better i won't have to debug as much um that is not true when you get better you still have to do the same amount of debugging as before but people just make you write harder code that's all it is you don't struggle any less this is the standard level of struggle that you're always going to be at with your code um the only difference is the code gets harder uh, and your struggle gets more difficult, but you're more able to deal with more difficult struggle. That's, that's all it is. That's the, <laughs> the thing. So what we need to think about is that um, debugging is not a necessary evil. It's not a bad thing that we have to do that is attached to the good thing that we want to do, which is writing code. We've got to understand that debugging is a vital part of writing code, and it's always going to be a part of writing code. And we need to treat it as part of our work, uh, not as something external that we have to deal with. Because if you think of it as like something external that has to be weathered or survived or dealt with, the way that you're going to start thinking about it is negatively, as opposed to being like, oh, we're going to have a good debugging session now. We're going to like really get through this and find out what's going on and stuff we're gonna we're gonna be like archaeologists we're gonna dig for treasure you know we're gonna find find the issues in this thing and, and then and figure our way around them right um if we start thinking about that way instead of thinking of it as like i wanted to do work but instead all i'm doing is debugging 
um, that kind of attitude is going to lead to like just a negative approach to problem solving and you're going to not really be held like the irony is like the the more you think of debugging as a negative thing the more, the more time you end up doing it whereas if you think of it as like what we're going to do is we're going to write this thing and then we're going to spend some time debugging it you know and this is a part of what we're doing um, that attitude will will help you out a lot more I think um, but yeah the thing I think that I wanted to to really sort of hammer home today was if you want to debug well if you want to be able to solve the problems well you've got to look after the meat brain so knowing that the meat brain is inherently not good at this um, an understanding of that allows you to approach these problems knowing that you're you're in a sense making up for your meat brain's uh, deficiencies so you need to you need to take that into account um, you need to look after the meat brain and you also need to um, make sure you use it in ways that it is capable of doing things um, and when it is not capable of doing things you support it so for example ooh, wait. here in this one going through line by line and, and figuring stuff out meat brain's really bad at that don't let the meat brain take control at this point um, at this point use your interactive but debugger make sure the rules are being implemented by the computer and at other times where you're trying to support your meat brain you know you support it by tricking it into forming ideas you know or you go let it relax you know give it some time don't don't send your meat brain into an infinite loop um, because you know I guess that's one thing we do have in common with the silicon brains once we're in an infinite loop we're stuck we're just as stuck as they are we actually in terms of a human software thing we need to stop that piece of software and we can do that in a human by starting to run a different piece of software you know so that's um that's the that's the end what i was going to say today and chicken hopes your debugging gets easier and 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 i will play you a song um this is i haven't played this in a long time let's see if i can remember it it's called st james infirmary There you go. <laughs> a bit of blues for uh, for a lockdown. I hope everyone is um, is okay. I don't know how many people are locked in their homes at the moment and stuff like that. Uh, but also, I hope that this uh, debugging thing helps a little bit. Um, I know that what I talked about, about today, the approach is very, very kind of holistic and not very mechanical. So I know that there's still heaps to learn. Like in each of those steps, there's, there's particular techniques for things, but I mean, I couldn't really dive down too deep into it in two hours, but what I wanted to do is try to give a, a really wide kind of um, uh, perspective on um, 
how we're going to approach debugging as like nearly as a pastime <laughs> or a pastime or like a, a process or a technique and stuff you know so hopefully um you can you can download a copy of the um the handout that i've given you and stuff like that to um uh to to maybe work through those steps next time you get stuck um i do have one other thing where is it where is it where is it where is it um alex has given me a link to to send out to everyone there is a feedback form here for for this workshop um and oh right <laughs> You posted exactly the same time I did, so I'm glad. I mean, of course you remembered it because you were going to remind me to do it. But um, here's a feedback. I think nearly every link um, that I've posted up today, um, someone else has posted exactly the same time I have. So it's good, you know, we're all thinking of the same things. It's perfect. Jinx, you can never speak again. Um, so yeah, so if you would like to leave some feedback, um, let CSCSOC know the kind of things that you're, that you're working on and stuff. Um, there's also a plug there from Alex for the next workshop, which is the um, personal project competition. I think there's also an AMA on tonight, I heard, so there's lots of little things going on that could be really useful. Um, yeah, so hopefully your lockdown's not too bad. You know, CC sucks going overboard to, to put a lot of stuff on this week to give people a chance to do things. I feel, I feel bad that, I mean, those of you in Sydney, if you're not in Sydney, then just enjoy your, like going off and doing whatever you want right but um but those of you in sydney i, I hope there's enough online stuff happening that you've got things to do and that, that you're um there's interesting things happening oh sure said tomorrow night is the ama all right thank you all um we actually have like a few minutes left if anyone has any questions or anything like that feel free to put them in chat now um otherwise we will we will wrap this up and um i will go off into the sunset or no no actually not not go from the sunset the lights the lights will go down on my illustrious blues career Kaichi is saying that the AMA is tonight. no more questions thank you very much for coming along um i haven't performed <laughs> i haven't performed music in a very long time <laughs> so it's pretty funny so the ama is tuesday not wednesday that's actually different from the last term's amas isn't it but that's okay yeah Alrighty. see you all soon um hope you enjoy your flex week even though flex week is usually the time where everyone just catches up on assignments and stuff like that but hopefully you take adequate breaks in between things while you're doing your debugging <laughs> all right see you all thank you very much <laughs>